Sail fan, her name is Sydney. She is one of my two rescue fish that I actually got from a pizza hut of all places. <laughs> what, are you doing the moonshiners method? I am. Said? About four months now. When I was cleaning it a couple days ago, I tried to get a head count. I stopped counting at 200. Oh my God. So people will go like, oh, I've got so much money in this tank. I'm like, yes, you have lives in there too. They're relying on you for their life support. Yep. All right, well, we are in Cleveland, the Cleveland area, and uh, we've been at Thans, we've been to Tidal Gardens, and decided to come check out some hobbyist tanks. You're a little bit more than a hobbyist, Jeff, right? Well, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so I've got, uh, you know, this all start, I've been in the hobby about eight years or so, and it was year 2020 when the, I moved the tanks out of my office here into my house that I built this project, then a bunch of other crazy stuff that we'll see downstairs. Yeah, so take, take us through this, uh, this planet aquarium here. This is a planet Mega Matrix 215, 72 inches long, 24 inches front to back, 29 inches high, uh, roughly 215 gallons minus the rock and sand displacement. I first put coral into here at the end of 2020, so it's been a couple years or so. Bunch of different uh, things. Everything that was that you see here in this tank came on in an inch or less when I first started. The overall vision with the tank was to be a SPS dominated tank. So mostly SPS in here, but then there's also some of the leathers that you see in there. We've got some other LPS as well. Fish gang in here, every fish has its own unique story. One of my personal favorite is uh, Gil right here. He's the Morish Idol. I've had him for just over a year. We're missing a head on a hammer thanks to him right there. <laughs> and uh, every now and then you'll just see missing tips on SPS if they look uh, yummy. So the, uh, the goal is to keep him as fed as possible. So Very. You, you said you feed this tank a lot. I do, yeah. This tank I'll feed anywhere between the three to four times a day. I'll show you right here. It's a, a mix. I make my own fish food. So actually I just went through and made an entire batch of it. Uh, it'll last me anywhere from four to six months. And I mix that 50% of my food with PE mysis. I'll also add in some of the Hakari frozen sponge as well, because sponge is an important part for the Moorish Idols diet. You've got uh, my sail fin. So sail fin, her name is Sydney. She is one of my two rescue fish that I actually got from a pizza hut of all places. <laughs> and they needed to uh, find a home for these fish. And someone that I knew knew somebody that worked at this pizza hut. Long story short, they got in touch with me and said, hey, we've got these two fish we think they're salt water, can you come rescue them? Oh, That's geez. all I knew. So I show on up and see this tank that looks beyond disgusting. And there happened to be one hippo tang and one sail fin on into there. And then sitting on top of the tank was a canister of goldfish flakes. <laughs> I said, please tell me this is not what you've been feeding them. They put, yeah, we just went to the store and got fish food. I'm like, they should have just fed them pizza. At that yeah, point. It might have been better. It, it, it might have been better. He's a big dude. He needs to be out of here. He's, he's too big for this tank at this point. Luckily, I'm in the process of building another 280 gallon system that'll give him two more feet of length to swim and an extra foot front to back. So that's Sydney's forever home, but it's not built quite yet. Let's talk coral real quick. I think what took my sight immediately was this giant bird's nest colony right here. <laughs> yes. So this was one, it's a ORA neon green bird's nest. Started out as a tiny little frag that I glued right there um, when I first got this tank. Uh, made tons of frags uh, off of this. Sell this, this is one of my staples when I do frag swaps. Actually, I think the other thing is just this wide array of leather here, this green leather. Yeah, wide array. And th so this was uh, our local reef club, Nori, the Nor Northern Ohio Reef Enthusiasts. This right here is about half of what it was a month or so ago, because okay. we had a fragging workshop, and this was one of the corals that we learned how to frag. So I hacked off a whole bunch of pieces of this and shared it with our entire reef club of having that. Obviously a lot of SPS up top, uh, different acros going up and around. What do you have lighting this whole entire thing? All right, so let's take a look at what we got lighting wise. So lighting under here, you've got three XR30s. Yes. Uh, G5s that are, they're doing from the beginning to the end. This tank usually wakes up around noon or so, blues in the beginning, it'll go more white midday, and then fade off to blues in the evening with it going totally black right around midnight. 
It's also got two rows of T5s up there as well. So the Blue Plus, those are only on for about three and a half hours in the peak high period uh, in the middle of the day. And two MP40s and two MP60s, it looks you, like? You got it, yeah. Two MP60s, two MP40s, MP60s here in the front, MP40s. Everything's run in anti-sync anti mode on ReefCrest. I wanted to put in some things that would grow on out relatively quickly, be able to fill the tank out. Now I'm kind of at the process of Let's remove select things like that other giant bird's nest colony that was over there. Let's get rid of that and let's put in something a bit more higher end into yeah. it. Because I've got a whole bunch of other stuff I'm looking at. I'm happy. Let's, you know, go through and kind of start trading some of those corals out. Well, let's uh, let's head down to the basement, check out the filtration, and you got some other goodies down there. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. All right. So we're down here in the filtration room in the basement. Yes. Uh, here's your sump. It's big. It is big. It is six feet long. It is two feet from front to back and it's 20 inches tall. So it's roughly about 130 or so gallons of water in this sump. I love it. It's simple, you know? It's simple. I mean- It's big, I, but it's simple. It, it is. So the, you know, it comes down into here, goes through three giant filter socks, goes into a refugium chamber. Uh, refugium is the main nutrient export on this tank. So yeah, growing Kato, pulling also that- solitary confinement if yeah, needed. Yes, and, and, <laughs> and a fish chamber if needed. Uh, then goes into the skimmer and then goes back on out through return. So it's simple, nothing too crazy onto here. Uh, the only media that I'm using, I do have one canister there. Whenever phosphates start to get up a little bit high, I'll throw a little bit of GFO into there. And then about once a month, run a uh, cartridge of carbon. Other features of this filtration, uh, you get the, the Trident, uh, some UV. So the Trident is testing eight times a day. It is control, Apex has control of the Neptune dose to be able to fluctuate those amounts based upon the consumption of the tank, which does work out really, really handy at times. So it's dosing BRS two part, calcium chloride and soda ash. Right now, alkalinity is roughly around 250 milliliters a day. Calcium is a little bit more around 300 or so milliliters a day. What do you shoot for with those numbers? Alkalinity, I'm trying to shoot for right around nine. Uh, calcium 420, uh, magnesium 1350. Okay. Magnesium, I'm just doing manually. So whenever I see that, that number start to fade on off, just manually dose some on gotcha. it. Gotcha. I will verify the Trident numbers once a week with test kits. Just make sure we're close. Usually it's dead spot on. And UV, it's a Pentair 50 watt UV. I've got it set up right here with those valves that I can control how much flow I want to send through there. Right now, I've just got all of the water that's going up to the 220. So that 220 display is right up there, kind of up in that area. That goes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, unless the tank gets over 80 degrees and then it'll shut that down to try to conserve some heat. Gotcha. All being driven, the 220 display is being driven off of a Abyss A200. So that is the main return pump for that. There's a Varios 8 uh, Reef Octopus pump that is driving the manifold and the frag tank. So that is doing the reactor as well as the frag tank. Hop it over here. So how do you change the UV lamp? All right, so I designed this knowing that I didn't have much space and I wasn't gonna be able to change that, pull that lamp out of the top. So I've got two, you, first of all, you'd isolate it off. So you'd go through, um, cut it off right here. You have two unions. So you could basically take this off. This, these are just held in by chains. You can disconnect the chains, but then you still had that power issue. So what I actually did is I got, these are from the entertainment industry. It's called a True One Power Connector. It's a IP65 waterproof power connector that I cut this wire from the Pentair, wired this plug in on each side. There we go. So that, that right there is the power connector you can take. And then now, once you disconnect the union, and disconnect these chains, just pull this entire unit out, service it here, and then install it right back in. So I thought about that of going through, of, I'm gonna have to service this one day, but I knew I had to go through and put it in this spot. And another detail is the color of the piping means something it down does, here. It does, it does. So when I, I did all the plumbing myself down here and wanted to make sure, you know, it, I was able to kind of figure out where everything goes. If it's gray, it is a drain line. So that is a line. These are the three that are coming from the big tank upstairs. If it is orange, it is a pressurized line. So that is either a return or this right here being the closed loop. And then blue, being a new water line. So when you see the mixing station on over there, that's where I mix up all the water. I can do a total a water change on this system just with turning valves. All right, well, you got a frag tank over here. I do have a frag tank. Let's take a look at it. So this is a 80 gallon frag tank, four feet by two feet by 16 inches. 
have, of course, the Stratosphere Zoa back here. Got a pop-up of this a couple months ago. It's now up to two it plus a baby. So the Stratosphere Zoa. A lot of SPS in here, especially in the middle. But then, of course, you know, the row of torches here. It's a little bit of everything. For lighting on that? Lighting 3X. 3XR30s running the exact same programs as the upstairs tank. So this frag tank and the upstairs tank both are driven off this sump. So it's one giant water volume. Overall water between the three, it's roughly 420 gallons. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a glass sitting out up there uh, to isolate him because he was originally on one of the rocks underneath the rack and he kept walking and stinging every SPS as he was going around. So when I finally did a deep clean of this tank, I decided, no, you're coming off the rock and you're not going to be able to go back to that rock. So at least for the time being, he's trapped on the glass. Now, I, what I do want to do, and I might do it with him is everybody always asks me how compatible are the Black Widows with other types of anemones. He might be one of my experiments of putting him in a NEM basket in that water volume just to see how everybody behaves. What, are you doing the Moonshiners method? I am. You said? So I, I've been on, doing, doing Moonshiners for about four months now. I'm just about ready to send in my fifth test. So w once a month you go through, send in an ATI t uh, ICP test, get your results on back, run it through the Reef Moonshiners calculator, and then you can figure out uh, how much of each different element you need. Currently I'm doing nine elements daily. So these are the daily elements that are pretty much designed for, um, they're, they're rapidly consumed in the system. That's why you add them daily. So, you know, everything's selenium, uh, we've got cobalt, we've got chromium, manganese. This is my large one. This one's got 58 drops a day. I've been told Ghanis love manganese, and yeah, I've got a bunch of those, so that goes through that. Iodine, that's five drops a day. Rubidium, vanadium, iron, and then this is their liquid mud. It's kind of just a whole bunch of ultra trace type elements. So every single night, usually before I go to bed, it doesn't take long, yeah, it's you know, every day, but you just go through and you know, say iron, 14 drops. Going over, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, 12, 13, 14, one done, eight more to go. You know, so how, how the method works is you've got some that are monthly corrections and some that are dailies. So something like a fluoride, uh, that's the biggest one. I mean, my last correction was two liters of fluoride to go into this system. So you'll do that, and you, it, the calculator tells you, you know, 100 milliliters a day for 10 days, 12 days, yeah. whatever it may be. You're just trying, you're, you're trying to get as close to the targets as possible. It's not total mad scientist of, you know, we need to hit exactly of, you know, 90 parts per million of this. No, it's just you want to try to get as close as you can to those natural uh, seawater levels. Uh, everything that we keep is ra raised in water, so it starts off with a um, multi-stage RODI units, the BRS seven stage on this one. Final product water is brought on over, dropped on into this tank right here. It's a 55 gallon tank. Wish I could have gone a little bit larger, but as you can see, we're at short ceilings down here in the basement. Can't, can't really, couldn't really go much more. And I didn't want to put these tanks on the ground and take real estate on the ground. Yeah. So this was the physically largest tank I could do uh, with still being able to access it and dump salt in on the top. Very cool. And this board is super clean. I think the one thing that really stood out to me was your uh, your battery backup yes. voltage meter here. Now, luckily, I've lived in this house for 13 years, and we haven't had a power outage more than four hours. I hope I didn't just jinx myself by <laughs> saying that right there. But I want to be, you know, we got have a lot invested here and a lot of lives at stake with uh, the reef tanks that are here. So I put a battery backup in. It's, a, it's driven off a array of car batteries that are back in that crawl space area. So they're constantly being charged by a trickle charger. And this is the uh, voltage meter on that system. So I can tell, make sure they're still alive, make sure they're still charged. If we were to experience a power outage, that right there drives all of the Ecotech gear in battery backup mode. People will go like, oh, I've got so much money in this tank. I'm like, yes, you have lives in there too. Yeah. Like it, their life support system is relying, they're relying on you for their life support. Yep. So, you know, power outage, power outage and fire, I think are the two worst things that could happen. Uh, you know, fire can knock things out and power outage right there. Uh, you know, once that flow stops, you have, you don't have days, you have hours. Heat for the main system runs on two different systems. So I've got two independent heater controllers onto here, one doing a 300 watt and one is a 600 watt. 
The 300 is the one, the only one that's going to be cycling a lot. The 600 only kicks on in if it absolutely needs to. So it's basically built in with programming to be two stage heat. So do we do we need to just call for 300 or do we need to call for for additional heat to it? It also allows two completely independent heater systems that will go through and you know if one were to fail, you've got another system as a backup. Apex is not controlling the power to these units on a on off on off regulating the temperature basis. Gotcha. However, Apex has the ability to shut down the power to both of these if the overall tank type temp does get too high. You were at the Black Widow tank. Yes, this is the anemone tank. This is a water box 100.3. All of the, as you can see, a lot of anemones. They mm. all started with one six, seven years ago or so. Uh, and I do sell these. I sell anywhere between five and 10 a week out of this tank. When I was cleaning it a couple days ago, I tried to get a head count, uh, be like, okay, how many are in here? I stopped counting at 200. Oh my gosh. So I, I, there's more than 200 onto here. Uh, it's a lot easier to count them at night when they're all kind of shriveled up into little balls. You can kind of go through and count them. And there are four fish in this tank. You've got my two original clowns, uh, Nemo and Marlin. They were my first two fish in the hobby. They're at least eight, eight years old. And then I've got one hippo tank, the other one from Pizza Hut and the yellow uh, biota captive bred yellow into here as well. Two uh, power heads for flow on this one. You've got an MP40 on this side, MP10 on that side. Have you ever had issues with them running into the... Rarely. So so very rarely. Here, here's what happens is, you know, I did originally put the NEM guards onto there and yeah, it'll keep the NEMs out theoretically, uh, but they clog up so quickly that every two, three days, you gotta be cleaning those NEM guards out. And I just got tired of doing that. Yeah. And then one day with a NEM guard, a NEM walked into it and actually got chopped up like through the NEM guard. And I went, well, these don't do anything anyway. Mm -hmm. It's rare, maybe once or twice a year, I'll have a NEM that gets cut up into confetti, but it's rare. Uh, another simple tank here. You said you don't do too much on this as far as do you dose anything or? This is the easiest tank ever. So I do about 10% water change twice, twice a month. Incredibly simple sump design. This was a you know a sump that I made on my own. It was, I kind of was like, all right, I'm just gonna temporarily just kind of rig this on up. You know, it's been three years and nothing's changed onto it. Uh, don't dose anything to it. I do feed the NEMS about every other week. So it'll either be a piece of krill per head. I try to feed as many as I can or if I'm feeling ambitious that day, I'll cut up silver sides. Yeah, I love it. It's just, it looks like a moving piece of art. It you know? is, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a great looking tank. Seems like they might also put kids through college at some point. <laughs> <laughs> they, they could, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of them here and you know, I've just gotten so used to working with them and you know, a lot of uh, these, this is the tank when people come on over, they, they really love it and kind of lose their mind on how many Black Widow and enemies are here in this tank. But yeah, just what I get to work with every day. Very cool. Well, Jeff, your system is awesome. And you. your attention to detail is pretty striking. So uh, thank you for taking us through your, uh, your tanks today. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on out and checking it out. Do you have an Instagram or anywhere that we can follow you? I've got Facebook, uh, <laughs> so you can, uh, Jeff Dick on Facebook. Feel free to add me as a friend. Uh, if I see you're at all interested in anything fish related, I'll add you as a friend. Awesome, sounds good, thanks man. Thank you so much. I wanna thank Jeff for letting us come over and check out his system. It's immaculate, it's so well thought out. I love every second of that video. And if you're a rat's nest kind of reefer, this might give you a little bit of inspiration to tidy up your system a little bit. So as you know, at the end of any tank tour video, Jake always asks for advice. I totally forgot to do this with Jeff, but I texted him and this is what he texted me back. I said, hey, can you give me some advice for hobbyists? And he said, pick a method and stick with it. There's a million ways to be successful in this hobby and consistency is key. So that said, I'm very, very excited to see how that Moonshiners method works out for him in the future. This was only part of our trip to Cleveland. We, of course, went to Tidal Gardens to hang out with Than. If you missed the Reef Therapy podcast this week, go check it out on the Reef Therapy YouTube channel. You can also find the podcast in audio form on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. And I'm also excited to say that we announced Reefstock Chattanooga September 2nd and 3rd. We'll have more as we get closer to the show, but for now you can go to reefstock.show for more. Okay, I think that's it for the housekeeping. 
portion of the show. If you can notice behind me, it is absolute disaster. I'm living out of a tub here. Frag tank is taken down. Red Sea stand is up. It's like a game of Tetris down here. So I cannot wait to show you what's going on. Very excited for that. It'll be in the next video. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you know whenever we upload new videos. And I'll see you in the next one.